Telecentric imaging falls on a spectrum of what I will call centricities, which are essentially defined by pupil location. In a normal imaging system, the entrance pupil is behind the first refracting surface, and the centricity most commonly encountered, and which describes the human eye, is entocentric. If one of the pupils, entrance or exit, is inside the lens system, then far away objects will appear smaller, and thus have smaller magnification, than close by objects, which of course is your everyday view of reality. When the entrance pupil is in front of the first surface, the imaging system is hypercentric. A consequence of hypercentricity is that farther objects appear to be larger, or rather have larger magnification. Maybe you see how this can be used to inspect the exterior of a part. A hypercentric camera looking head on to this cube will better reveal the sides of the cube because the footprint becomes larger for planes farther away from the top. If there's writing on the side of the cube, you can actually read it from above with a hypercentric lens. When one of the pupils is located at infinity, the imaging system is telecentric. If both of the pupils are at infinity, the system is two-sided telecentric, and magnification for such an afocal imaging system depends on neither object nor image distance, resulting in images where far away objects appear just as large as nearby objects. To describe telecentric imaging, it helps to compare it to normal or entocentric imaging. If you want to measure the sizes of these cubes, and all you have is a camera and a ruler that is fixed in place between the camera and the objects, you might capture an image of the ruler in front of the cube, and try to match the lines of the ruler with the edges of the cube. You can expect to get a more accurate read on the cube that is closer to the ruler. That is certainly due first to the fact that the farther cube has smaller magnification, and thus appears smaller on the image surface, and second to the problem of parallax, which results from the edges of the distant cube not lining up with the correct lines on the ruler. If the camera lens is telecentric, then both the near cube and the far cube will have the same magnification, and thus the same image size. Likewise, the ruler will have the same magnification. Both cubes appear identically sized because a telecentric lens selectively gathers light that is parallel to the optical axis. This parallel nature of the light doesn't just eliminate depth perception, it eliminates parallax. Now an imaging system can accurately measure dimensions in a three-dimensional scene, which is a key function of machine vision systems. Maybe look at it like this. If a normal imaging system is looking down on these three cylinders, each cylinder will appear differently in the normal view, depending on the location of the cylinder relative to the optical axis. A telecentric view will present each cylinder as identical, with only the rays parallel to the optical axis making it through the lens, the sides of the cylinders will be difficult to perceive in a telecentric view. The comparison hardly stops with that. The normal lens can have a wide field of view, whereas the telecentric lens only gathers on-axis light, meaning that the telecentric lens will need to be larger in order to view the same scene. A large lens diameter is used in order to provide the telecentric lens with a wide linear field of view. So how does a telecentric lens work? A telecentric lens forces the chief ray to be parallel to the optical axis on object side, on image side, or on both sides. It's easy to make this happen by positioning a physical aperture stop at the back focal point, the front focal point, or at a common focal point in case there are two lens groups. The parallel orientation of the chief ray presents a problem with locating the pupils, because the chief ray crosses the optical axis at the pupils and at the aperture stop. It would seem then that the entrance and exit pupils in the doubly telecentric system illustrated here are infinitely far away. And in fact, they are located at infinity, because principal planes are located at the point where incoming and outgoing rays intersect both principal planes of a doubly telecentric system are also located at infinity, meaning that a doubly telecentric system is afocal, and the f number isn't even a suitable metric then for the system aperture. Instead, it's better to use perhaps the paraxial working f number, which is inversely proportional to the numerical aperture, and depends on the location along the optical axis of an axial emitting point source. The ratio of numerical apertures on the object and the image side 
is the paraxial magnification, or PMAG in ZMAX Optic Studio. Using a parallel chief ray as the criteria for telecentricity, it should follow that there are three possible telecentric conditions. If the chief ray is parallel to the optical axis on the object side of the imaging system, then the telecentricity is object side. This condition can be accomplished with a landscape configuration where the aperture stop is positioned at the rear focal point of the lens, or the lens group. When telecentricity is object side, the image height is the same for all object distances. This might seem unlikely to you because you know that as the object moves farther away from the lens, the focused image moves closer to the lens, and closer to the optical axis. That is, the far object has a smaller magnification. Well, that doesn't really change. That's still true. But it is the focused image that moves closer to the lens and to the optical axis. Consider this. When a point object is at position 1, its focused image forms on the screen. Now, if the point object moves to position 2, its focused image forms closer to the lens, as well as closer to the optical axis, as expected. It's what's happening on the screen that's important. The light that forms the nicely focused image continues onto the screen and leaves an unfocused blur. It's the center of that blur that is at the same height as the nicely focused image formed by the object when it is at position 1. And that's what matters. The detector array will indicate the same image height at the screen for a range of object locations. In many machine vision applications, that might be all that is needed in order to locate an edge or to measure a part dimension. So for the purpose of machine vision, using object side telecentricity, the working distance has quite a bit larger range than just the depth of field, which is constrained by image quality. If the chief ray is parallel to the optic axis on the image side of the imaging system, then the telecentricity is image-sided. The image still focuses at the point predicted by the Gaussian lens equation, but by positioning the aperture stop at the front focal point, the image height is the same for all image distances. This means that you can move the image detector, and the image only blurs, but it doesn't change size. The average height of light in the blur is the same regardless of where along the optical axis you put the image surface. In order to derive the benefits of both image and object-sided telecentricity, a second lens group is added, or as is depicted here for simplicity, a second thin lens, by co-locating the front focal point of the second lens with the back focal point of the first lens, an incoming parallel ray will also emerge parallel. The chief ray is arranged to come in parallel by locating a stop at the common focal point. Rays do depart from other locations in object space. One principal ray, which for this purpose I'll just call the front focal ray, departs from the optical axis, meeting the lens at the field of view. The size of the aperture stop is whatever it takes to permit that front focal ray to reach the edge of the field of view at the first refracting surface, and then just barely make it through the rest of the system. This ray is parallel to the optical axis after the first lens group. If the aperture stop is any larger than shown here, then the field of view grows beyond what is intended. In a two-sided telecentric lens, the numerical aperture or the object side paraxial working F number can be used then as the quantity for the system aperture. Because both the incoming and the outgoing rays are parallel, there's no overall refraction, and the power of a doubly telecentric system is zero, or rather its effective focal length is infinity. Nevertheless, an afocal system has magnification, seen here as the ratio of chief ray height after the system to the chief ray height before the system. To see more about that, see my video on laser beam expanders. The angular magnification, A mag in ZMAX Optic Studio, is the ratio of front focal angle in image space to front focal angle in object space. And it is the inverse of paraxial magnification, the ratio of image height to object height. And actually, this ray does not need to be a focal ray. Any ray that emerges from the optical axis will have the same value of U over U prime. Practically speaking, if y naught is the maximum object height, or rather the field of view, then y sub i is the format size, or rather the necessary size of the detector array. 
In a two-sided telecentric system, the maximum object height functions as the field of view rather than the subtended angle. And because the chief ray merges parallel to the optic axis, light strikes normal to the detector at all fields. Meaning that the cosine to the fourth law which results in a dimmer image at larger field angles has no relevance here. Consequently, telecentric lenses are quite useful for providing uniform spotlight illumination. Now there are several telecentric lens patents, and this particular patent describes a double gauss lens, which is by itself not telecentric, but sandwiched between positive meniscus lenses renders it telecentric. An aperture stop locates where the chief ray intersects with the optical axis. This patented telecentric lens is used to examine wells drilled into plates and has a 15 centimeter wide non-angular field of view. Light is captured and refracted by a field lens which is located on a telescoping mount in order to give adjustability to the magnification. And finally field curvature at the image is eliminated with a field flattener. With this theory of telecentricity described, let's put it into an Excel spreadsheet and see what we calculate. I began by showing numbers that are the same numbers used in an example in Kidger on page 53, so they're a little different than the numbers in the drawing at the bottom. I'm using a plano convex lens with a radius of curvature of minus 9.75 millimeters in front, and then an identical convex plano lens on the back, and I'm putting 16 millimeters between each lens and aperture stop, which is located halfway in between. And the spreadsheet calculates a telecentricity of 7.57 times 10 minus 3 degrees, or rather 1.32 times 10 minus 4 radians, and that shows up right down here in the end. If you want to see how a YNU spreadsheet is constructed, I suggest you see my video on constructing a YNU spreadsheet. I'm going to go into the actual spreadsheet and explain it to you in a minute. There's a challenge here with knowing the incoming angle of the chief ray. Ideally, in telecentricity, the chief ray comes in parallel to the optic axis, and therefore its incoming angle is zero. But in reality, it's not zero, and that deviation from zero is what is called the telecentricity. We need to use the spreadsheet to find the telecentricity, given this arrangement of lenses and the aperture stop. The chief ray actually comes in at 1.322 times 10 to the minus 4 radians, or rather 0 0.00757 degrees. It's a little tricky to calculate that incoming angle because the only thing we can constrain is where the chief ray hits the optical axis using the aperture stop. So we start with that, and it's actually necessary to calculate the incoming angle of the chief ray given the fact that it passes through the optical axis at the aperture stop. And that's what's going on in the gray box here. I would outline the derivation of the equations. There's the front lens. So the chief ray comes in along line one here and it strikes the lens at point two, an angle of U1 and a height of H1. And then it passes through the lens along path three and it strikes the back surface of the lens at point four and refracts and then follows path five until it hits the optic axis at exactly where the aperture stop is located. So D is the distance from the back of the lens to the aperture stop. T is the thickness of the lens. D0 is the distance from the object to the front of the lens. And ideally, any value of D0 should work because ideally, U sub 1, the angle, is 0. But it's not in reality, and we're going to figure out what it should be. Given these angles, the angle of incidence, U1, for the chief ray, and then the angle at which it strikes the back surface, U2, and then the angle from which it emerges, U2 prime. So we write the praxial ray trace equations that are outlined in Geary chapter four. First, along line one, we have a straight line transfer, and we strike the lens at point two, and at point two, a refraction occurs, and that uses praxial ray trace equation number one, and then from two to three, we have a straight line transfer again, and then at point four, there's a refraction again, and then along line five, there's a straight line landing at the optic axis, and so the height is zero at the end of line five. So now we have five equations, and we need to solve them to find u sub one. And I'm just going to give you that result. Ideally, u sub one is zero, but we're gonna find out what it really is, given things like the thickness of the lens, the index of refraction, the location of the aperture stop. Solving those five equations gives this expression, where A and B are, are dummy expressions that I uh, use just to clean it up a little bit, and so we need to have this thing called A and this thing called B. Phi sub 1 and phi sub 2 are the powers of the front surface and the back surface, respectively, and is the refractive index of the lens material. 
So here we are in the Excel spreadsheet, and the blue numbers are inputs from the user, and the black numbers are formulas. So the user defines the radii, so we have a flat surface with an infinite radius of curvature, and then the two curved surfaces, and a flat surface. There's a stop in between. You know, a stop after a lens is always tricky, and that's why this gray box is over here with the equations we just derived. Curvatures are just inverses of the radii, and the thicknesses are put in by the user, and I just put in the thicknesses that were in that Kidger example, as well as either refractive indices, air being one. The powers are then calculated from the expression for power, the difference in refractive indices times the curvature of each surface. And of course the stop has zero power, as do the flat surfaces. The most important ray is the chief ray. And of course I'm following the Kidger example where that object was defined at a given height, 1.47351, that sounds pretty specific, but it was chosen along with this object distance to give an incoming axial ray angle of 0 0.1. Now that's the only reason. Ideally the chief ray would be coming in at 0, but it's coming in at that, 10 to the minus 4. So as far as this 0.1 radian angle for the axial ray is concerned, if I change something like say this thickness, I'll change it to 25, You'll notice the telecentricity does not change. That's good, because that, that means that we have not uh, created a situation where the telecentricity depends on where along the axis the light comes from. So to follow the chief ray through, use the praxial ray trace equations to find out the height of the chief ray at each surface. And of course, at the stop, it needs to be at zero. So it should be symmetric about the stop if the lenses are symmetric about the stop, which they are in this design. And the angle of the chief ray is calculated using what's in the gray box over here. I'll get triple O one three two radians for the incoming angle of the chief ray in order to have it pass through the aperture stop on the optic axis. And then the praxial ray trace equations are used to propagate that ray through and find the output angle. Since the lenses are symmetric, so the output angle of the chief ray equals the input angle of the chief ray. And we get a telecentricity of 00757 degrees, which is just that 1.322 times the minus 4 radians converted to degrees. The magnification is computed from the ratio of chief ray height at the image point to chief ray height at the object. Angular magnification is calculated from the axial ray angle at the output from the back surface divided by the axial ray angle coming in at the front surface. We'll use the axial ray to find the point where the outcoming ray hits the optic axis, which will happen at the focal point. And so we take that output ray height and divide it by index of refraction and the uh, angle. In this case, I actually use tangent to get more specific, but we are in the small angle approximation. And we have a 14.685 millimeter distance from the back glass surface to the point where light strikes the optic axis. An effective focal length can be calculated from the incoming parallel ray height divided by the angle that an outcoming parallel ray has relative to the horizontal. We get an effective focal length of 5,572 millimeters, which is exactly what Kidger found in his, his example. And then finally, there's a sanity test. The lateral magnification should equal 1 divided by the angular magnification, which means then that this ratio of heights times this ratio of angles should be very close to 1, and it, it is. So now we can play around. Let's change one of the radii of the lens from 9.75 to 15. And watch what happens to the telecentricity. Okay, the telecentricity on the output is significantly affected, but not on the input. I want to bring that telecentricity back to zero, and so to do that, I need to start playing around with this. Do I make the distance from the stop to the back lens front surface larger or smaller? Let's try smaller. Nope, let's try larger. And that's the direction we have to head. And we have some small angle now. So we're back to having a telecentric system. You can now write your own spreadsheet and play around with your own numbers to get this telecentric system. You can make it more complicated. The front and the back surfaces of the glasses don't have to be planar. You can replace them with uh, achromatic doublets and make this even more complex. You can add several surfaces. But if you add several surfaces, it becomes a little difficult for a spreadsheet because now you need to come up with an expression for where the stop is located behind several lenses, and that's a mess. So I'm keeping it simple to one piece of glass in front so I can learn about telecentricity. Okay, well, thanks for watching, and good luck with your own spreadsheet.